Welcome back to Key Points. Uh, this is the second part of our discussion, and I told you that we will be talking about Ghana's COVID-19 fight. Uh, critically, you know by now that the, our case stands at uh, 7,616, and with 2,421 uh, recoveries, we're, we're told that there have been one more death in addition to the 34, which has been uh, uh, recorded as of May 29 uh, at midnight. Ghana's infection rate, we're going to discuss the infection rates and uh, clarify whether the daily infection rates are decreasing or going up, what we can learn from that, and uh, significant surges in recoveries. There have been questions raised about the numbers. Uh, this morning we'll get the opportunity to uh, discuss all of that. We'll also check on the updates on Obuasi, the hotspots, Obuasi, uh, Tema, Loa Manya Krobo, and then also we will discuss the management of persons, ask critical questions of whether uh, there is still aggressive uh, uh, testing and contact tracing, same as it was from the very beginning. And also, there's all, there are discussions over whether or not to ease restrictions in churches, mosques, schools, uh, bars and restaurants, etc. We want to find out whether there have been any protocols considered for reopening and, and then uh, whether we have, we're learning uh, to live with COVID or we have to just adopt to the new norm. Uh, this is key points. And uh, this morning, I'm fortunate to have in the studio Dr. Bidu Sarkodie, who is the Director of Public Health, uh, Ghana Health Service. Uh, joining us also via Zoom will be uh, Professor Fred Binker, who is a professor of epidemiology, and uh, Dr. Michael Owusu, who is a virologist at KCCR. They'll also be joining us via Zoom for this conversation. Uh, gentlemen, uh, nice to have you on Zoom. And then, Doc, grateful to have you in our studio this morning. I'll start with you. I mean, I wanted to give us a, a, a breakdown of what the current situation is today. I know what we have on the website indicates 7,616, 2,421 recoveries, uh, 34 deaths. Has anything changed? Right. Thank you very much. Good morning to our church viewers. Uh, indeed, there have been a slight increase in some of the parameters, and the, what we have here mm. is just a few hours behind Be what behind. I have. Okay. And I think that okay. very soon, the situation will change, mm. it will be updated, mm. and the situation will change to what I have here. And the total number of cases, the case load stands at 7,768. Mm. The recoveries are 2,540. Mm. The, those that are in severe and critical conditions add up to 20. Severe conditions, 15, and critical conditions are five. Mm. And then the total number of deaths as at now, I think you rightly mentioned there's one yeah. additional death, mm. just a brief, this is a 70 year old woman who was rushed to a hospital with um, heart conditions. And the heart at that time was compromised. And I'm assessed to have been failed. And he had hypertension earlier. She was reassessed. There were a few signs and symptoms of respiration. And then based on that, consideration was made to test for COVID. And after her death, a few days later, Results. the results came positive. positive. So this is COVID related. And mm -hmm. that is why I keep saying whether it was a heart condition or the uh, COVID that killed, it's difficult to assess now. Mm. Autopsy will be the best way to assess mm. it, but this has not mm. been done on this mm. one. Mm. So the death toll now stands up to 35. Right, so uh, there have been a whole lot of discussions of uh, the surge in, in, in recoveries. I, as you're here today, I'd like you to clarify what has been responsible for the uh, surge in the number of recoveries. It's good news, though, that right. people are recovering, but there have been questions of how the numbers kept jumping uh, in, at the rate it, it does. Uh, can you offer us some clarity? Yes, thanks once again. Indeed, um, the recoveries, the situation has improved. It's the reportage mm. of the surge situation that I've seen to have mm. um, surged. Mm. Um, we, when you have cases to monitor, this cohort of people confirmed or even if it's an individual, this person has to go through a journey of 14 days from time of confirmation to be monitored. Then 
at the end of the 14 day period, we do first test to assess the extent of recovery. And again, do the test again, day 16. The two consecutive within the period of 24 to 48 hours have to be serially positive. Mm. And that is how we assess an individual to have been recovered from the viral infection. Mm. Indeed, um, the, most of the disease condition, when you are saying that you've recovered, you base on the recovery on signs and symptoms. Mm. If you are having fever, cough, acute respiratory illness, and all these symptoms subside and disappear on treatment, we can classify you as recovered. recovered. However, with COVID, mm. the recovery is laboratory and two serial tests after 14 days of being positive mm. have to be negative. Mm. And that is what we classify as um, recovered. Indeed, it conforms to the World Health Organization standards and other international standards. Most importantly, um, why we have to do that if people are still with the virus and don't have signs and symptoms, they have the potential to shed mm. and spread. So whilst we have the pandemic and the focus is to reduce rate of transmission, it's appropriate that you go this way. And then um, one reason why we started having surge initially, we had to monitor some cohort of people for at least 14 days. Mm. So no matter the number, if they are not up to 14 days, you cannot start assessing them. Mm. And then when we started, when they were at the period of 14 days that we had to start taking samples to assess whether they are reverted negative, we faced a challenge of quite significant number of samples in the laboratory and people that are positive, you trace their contacts, and then the contact sample taken from the contacts. We needed to establish whether these people are having any virus, the virus in them. So the priority when you were a bit overburdened with the number of tests to do in the lab was on those that we needed to establish the positivity status. So those that were due for assessment to be retested to find out whether they are recovered, I think they were not top priority at that time. Mm. So the sample had been taken, but then they were waiting. And when the backlog was cleared from those that we needed to test and decide on case management, we had more opportunity to test for those right. that have, have been assessed for recovery. Right. So mm. there was quite a backlog during the clearance and clearly having taken quite a significant number of um, samples, those that have proven to be double negative were quite high number. High, high number. And indeed, there are still quite a number of people that you have done the first test negative and are awaiting the second test to be also declared negative. So even from here, you continue to see more and more people um, re that re recovered. have recovered. Uh, we'll be going to Zoom uh, to have a conversation with uh, Professor Binka and Dr. Michael also. But uh, I wanted to quickly get ask you this question before I go to them. Are we still doing aggressive testing and contact tracing? Because it, it appears that the aggression has slowed down. No. The model and the strategy for Ghana has not changed. Mm. Our approach that initially, if people are having signs and symptoms of um, acute respiratory illness with a contact to somebody or with exposure, test this person and assess whether this acute respiratory illness is COVID. And when, so and that when is they, ongoing. And when they test positive, you, you then find when you test positive, all the contacts are line listed. And instead of waiting for the contacts to develop symptoms, no, we immediately take samples from all the contacts 
and sent to the lab and assessed. Yes. And this is actively ongoing. This is actively ongoing. So right. nothing yeah. has changed. Dr. Bedou Sakode, I'll quickly so the uh, go to Zoom goes, right um, now and uh, speak with uh, Professor Binka and Dr. Michael Osu. Gentlemen, uh, thanks very much uh, for joining us as always. And we're grateful. We've heard from Dr. Bedou Sakode uh, giving us a narrative which um, I am happy about that we are still doing aggressive contact tracing. We're still doing aggressive testing. But irrespective of that, we, we have the numbers surging. We have the recoveries also surging. Today, we have recorded one more death, uh, adding to the, to the total already of 34. Now it's 35. So from where you stand, gentlemen, and from all the work that the health service is doing, are you confident that we are on the right track? I'll start with Professor Binka. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and good morning to your listeners. Uh, good morning to my panelists, uh, Dr. Owusu and Dr. Sakodia. Uh, my answer, from where I sit here, I have a yes and a no. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate the Ghana Health Service for what they're doing. Uh, they're doing a good job, uh, but we can also improve on what we are doing. That is, all, that is what the whole purpose is. Let me clarify a few things. Uh, these days, I have not been following the numbers very well because... I have a feeling that uh, the strategy is not being fully implemented. I'll come to that later. Secondly, let me also remind you about uh, people worrying about the recovery. Uh, early this month, we started having large numbers of people who were positive. For example, in May, on the May, 9th of May, we had 900 people. On the uh, 10th, we had 151. On the 11th, we had five. 133, and on the 12th or so, we had another 427. So we should expect the number recovering to come in those bouts, 14 days after the tests have been done. So the numbers that are recovering are not strange numbers. They, we, that is what we should expect, that two weeks after these people have been tested positive, they will get another test. And then if they are negative, they'll get the second serial test, as uh, uh, Dr. Sarkozy has mentioned. And then they will uh, what be declared uh, 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 free from the virus hmm. and then released as having been cured. So I don't think people should worry about those numbers. That's what we expect. Now, let me go to the substantive issue. I, from where I sit, I am not happy with the strategy that Ghana is adopting currently. We, we adapted this from the beginning. Somewhere along the line, we added the enhanced testing. And now we've gone back to the, uh, the testing and then the tracing. Uh, testing and tracing is part of it, will always be part of uh, the strategy. But when you have a, a local transmission, it is impossible to only use that method because if you get a market woman in a Malata market, positive, I'm sure she cannot tell you her contacts. Who did she travel with in the trot to the to the market or to the house? Where did she go to buy her goods and so on? So that aspect uh, becomes very faulty with the local transmission. So, so, so Prof, it's Prof, what will be the alternative to this? I mean, if you see the tracing being defective in our, it, because of our social structure, I agree with that. But what will be the best alternative uh, to this? So what you do is that you have an idea where the person is, and then you start some mass testing. You will zone the area and you test everybody, not their contacts. Because she can't tell you her contacts, mm. for God's sake. It's not possible. Yes. So you have, to, you have to move to an area. If she's in the market, you test the people in the market. She doesn't have to say, these are my contacts. If she lives somewhere, you test the people in that area. Because you can't definitely know how she, uh, 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 her contacts are. If she's using a throat throat that is coming from uh, Kanishi to Accra, those straw trots, the people there who are working there, you have to test them. So it has to change a little bit because mm. tracing the contacts is not ideal. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we are having a few problems in the, in the data. Let me go back to the data. Uh, the data, the numbers, I am very happy about, and I'm happy that Dr. Sarkozy is there. What I am unhappy about is 
uh, Savannah region, one positive, Bron, one positive, Bonu uh, region, one positive, Bonu East, one, uh, another one, zero, and then Northeast, two. And we find them week after week. That gives me a lot of, uh, uh, a little bit of worry because it means we need to find those viruses that are going to those places and look for them because the virologists must look at the feature of that virus that does not transmit, you know? So it, it, uh, it must include, have we searched enough? Have we tested enough? Mm. Because if you find one positive and you don't find any transmission, that should be a source of worry. It's, it's a, a unique virus that is there. In fact, that is the major problem we have with this virus, that we can't look at people and find whether they have the virus or not. The asymptomatic are our major uh, area of worry. So please, th those things are important. Those are the things that we should be looking with the figures. Right. And I will also expect that in the reporting now, going forward in our strategy, we should report how many we are testing. We can easily not test and come and say the things are going down. How do we know? We those who are outside and watching. We can tell how many people were tested last week or the week before. There might be some logistic challenges. There might be even no test kits to be able to test and so on. Then we report that the things, uh, the numbers are coming down. It will give us a false hope of where things are going. And we might be really surprised because unfortunately, if you look at what is happening in Brazil, you should be worried because we have the same climate like Brazil and uh, they are virtually uh, uh, in trouble now. Mm. Right. Uh, so let me hear from uh, Dr. Michael Ousu also. Uh, Doc, uh, thanks very much uh, for uh, joining us. So you, you've heard Professor Binka. Obviously, you are a virologist, so you might have a view also on the position. The position he has is that if we continue doing tracing, uh, contact tracing, then we might miss out. That we need to elevate the testing to mass testing. That's the only way we can uh, be assured that we're capturing everybody who is at risk and testing them. Is that your view too? Uh, good morning to uh, Prof. Binka. Uh, good morning to Dr. Bedusako. Mm. Yes, I, I agree with, with Prof. Binka. Not to say that Ghana, Ghana has done well, we need to do as a country, compared to our neighboring countries in terms of uh, test per million in West Africa, I think we, we've done uh, very well. The mortality rate compared to others, we, we also have done well. Because of so many things, we started with initi initiatives in mandatory quarantine, in testing. At the point in time when we started the enhanced testing, the strategy was to look out for those who are coming to the country to trace some two kilometers uh, I mean, for every cases and to test as wide as possible. But this is what resulted in huge backlogs because then we had huge numbers of samples coming in and the capacity to test and deliver results in real time I mean, was, was a problem. This is why for Nguche and KCCR, we had to report results in a week or two. So we've moved beyond that stage. And now we're trying to, as much as possible, deliver results within a real, I mean, short turnaround time. But then, uh, like we always say, the strategy for testing as I as as of now, it's not too clear for me. I mean, how how we are going? The same numbers of testing between four to five thousand tests per day is what we are doing currently. And this is purely based on PCR. And like we always say, PCR always looks for active case detection, what is meant for a hospital environment. But for this disease, for you to be able to understand what to do and easing restrictions and what approach and, and how wide these are circulated then the true burden of disease is very, very important. And you can test that by doing mass testing of populations mm -hmm. at risk and severally. For me, if you have one case in the region, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think so at this level. I don't think it's one case. It is more, except that we have not done much testing. Mm -hmm. And I will expect that, and we always keep saying this, that what is the role of serological tests mm -hmm. in this? And we have to, as a matter of agency, quickly deploy this to augment the PCR and limit the PCR to healthcare facility testing, which is the way to go. I mean, for the marketplaces, for the hot zones, for almost every place, just do the IgM, IgG antibody test and know the true burden of cases. Then you can use this to determine the, your transmission rates, whether you are reducing new cases or increasing new cases. And then you can quantify this to determine your productive number, which is the key 
to taking decisions on easing restrictions. I mean, if you look at WHO criteria, the first one is that your transmission must be controlled. And you should quantify this in terms of the reproductive number, which should be below one. And once you are below one, it tells you that the transmission is almost, almost low and the new cases are falling. Then we can know what to do. But then if you base this on PCR, it's a big limitation. And there are countries which are using, using this serological antibody case. I know the FDA are in the process of validating or evaluating the kit. And as we speak now, I'm not too sure what is happening. Until we have this deployed, it is difficult to tell what is happening. And right. I always say that we, we seem to be in the dark. You think we are, we think we are doing well, but this is just one half of the picture. The wider picture as to what is happening on the ground, we still don't have a hold of it. And until we get to that point, it is difficult to tell where you are going next. You can, you can move in it's like in a dark tunnel, but you can be faced with unknown things that can hit you and you realize you've made a mistake and have to go back. So right. Uh, Dr. I agree Mike. that we hmm. still need to do more in terms of testing. And the testing has to... We, we have facilities which have come on board. I mean, for me, Tamale is on board. Uh, um, West is on board. But how many are each of them testing? This should be displayed for us to know how many testing is Tamale doing for all the northern parts. How many testing is Western region doing for all their parts? How many cases here we have already already been ported to Gucci and all the other centers? This must be displayed, test per daily basis, and you can compute that based on the positivity rate. And for, and as we speak now, the Tamale tests we don't know how many they are doing. Western region, I'm not too sure. We only see a bulk number. The disaggregated values of these tests it, it's not it's not clear. So right. you can't really move to tell where we are and what we are doing. It's very difficult. We are doing well, but I think that we still need to do uh, more. We still need to do more. Dr. Michael Ozo and uh, Professor Fred Binka, let me get a reaction from uh, Dr. Bedu Sarkodie. You, you, you heard the gentleman yeah, and, and their much. presentations, I and I think it's... Mm. clear. And um, good morning, uh, Professor Binka. Good morning, Dr. Michael Ozo. Indeed, uh, quite a number of issues have been raised, and some of them... I have to respond to indeed. Um, the issue on, let me start from that of Professor Binka. The enhanced testing, and as much as possible, you need to do more. Initially, you were doing the, what we classify as sweeping, that when you get a case that within some perimeter, you have to do further tests to assess whether people in these areas are also having the virus. The, that was very good. It, was, it enabled us to, to a large extent get all many people as much as possible that potentially positive and pick them out, isolated them. This also reduces the transmission. But then the fundamental principle behind that was to establish community spread. And that is clearly established. We know that community spread is not an issue for us as a country for now. Initially, most of the cases were linked to imported cases and that are we having community spread, and is it just the people direct contact to the cases that are coming up? The sweeping was to establish community spread. This is established. So do we have to go beyond this, and then having in mind that all these things have um, logistics and, and, and financial cost implications, implications, and cost implications. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it would have been good for every Ghanaian to know the status. Mm -hmm. It is not possible, no country can do that. So as much as we appreciate this is the ideal, it's difficult to implement when you are talking about cost. There are issues that um, Dr. Osu Mike, we mentioned. I agree with you. The best way forward, more testing. Everybody know the status. You need the rapid diagnostic test. You've mentioned severally, having brought on board the number of other new laboratories to add on. Um, we have improved our testing capability, and that was the reason behind overcoming the overwhelming nature that we had and the challenge we had in the laboratory. The rapid diagnostic test, Ghana was among the countries that initially started the process to evaluate and validate the various um, characteristics of those RDTs that are available, including locally manufactured RDT. These have not, we have not been able to identify any of them or significant sensitivity and specificity to use. So the process is ongoing. The Food and Drug Authority working with Noguchi and other good labs are still in the process evaluating. When something comes out, you would use this. So we do appreciate the need for the um, RDT, but then accept that none of these have proven to 
be effective mm. for use for now. Other countries are using it. Probably the, the CDC actually has raised questions with the, uh, the, the, the those methods uh, that using antibody used. tests. Indeed, yeah. and well, the, 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 the high um, um, false positive, high false negative, it raised a lot of concerns. Mm. And those mm. are the challenges that we have with the RDT. So over the period, we have not given up. I'm sure something will emerge with good characteristics that can be brought on board. I think these are things that, that, they, that, that, that they raise. But, but I want to shift the conversation to uh, easing of restrictions. I know that the, no, no, the no, president's no, announcement, no, right, I see Professor please. Binka wanted to yeah, say something. Please, Pro can, can we, Professor Binka, you, you wanted to say something. Mm. Yes, I definitely wanted to say something. Uh, Professor uh, Binka. Dr. Sokodie, we, we have a problem looking at the uh, what the hands testing to be establishing community uh, uh, what uh, uh, transmission no we are doing those things we are doing these things to try and make sure that we don't overwhelm the health system that's why we are trying to be ahead of the virus so that we can remove those who are transmitting and not overwhelm the health system if we take these routes we wake up one day the number of health workers will start increasing. Those who are getting infected are increasing. And one day, nobody will go to work. The health system will collapse, and then there'll be a problem. So let's not look at it that way. We are trying to find and remove these people so that the health system can be protected. In fact, the British have the best uh, uh, slogan on this. They'll say, go and test so that you can what, protect the NH uh, NHS. If we get overwhelmed, there will be a problem. So that's my first point. Let's not take that it is to establish community uh, transmission. No, I don't agree with that. This, the other thing is that we have to look at the cost implications. If we start having this epidemic, uh, what, hotspots, huge hotspots, there will be a problem for all of us. And this health system is what you should be looking at to make sure that it does not collapse. When it collapses, all your measures will come to nothing. Right. Uh, Pro so, Professor Binga, I'll, I'll have you hold. And uh, Dr. Bedusa Akodye, uh, a gentleman, and Dr. Michael also will hold briefly. We'll take a break. And while we return, we'll jump into other aspects of the discussion, especially uh, as is likely the president might make an announcement because the, the deadline for all the restrictions is today, actually. And so, will there be new restrictions? Will there be a review of the re restrictions? Will the restrictions be eased? These are questions we need to uh, ask based on the existing science. I'm Stephen Antti, this is Key Points. Please stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome uh, back to Key Points. Uh, this is the second part of our discussions and uh, we're talking about Ghana's COVID-19 case. We have Dr. Bedu Sakode in the studio and then Professor Binka and Dr. Michael Ousu are on Zoom joining the conversation. So uh, we finished off with uh, Professor Binka a while ago and uh, Dr. Bedu Sakode raised some concerns with the IDT. Uh, Dr. Ousu, uh, I, you have some uh, concerns about the IDT and the position raised by Dr. Bedu Sakode. Uh, yes, uh, if, if I heard uh, Dr. Bedu Sakode rightly, I think he mentioned that the kits evaluated by the FDA so far uh, seem to show that uh, the kits are not uh, uh, working well and, and more has to be done. I, I think it's quite disturbing that I know there are about 10 kids that they were evaluating and I'm not aware of an official report issued on this. The methodology for evaluating these kids is not clear to me. And at this point where we are, we are in such a crisis, every information is needed for us to assess, to understand and to know what is exactly happening. You don't need a foolproof RDT kit in this emergency to allow its operation. This is why... The FDA have issued emergency approval for a number of cases which are now going trial in different countries. You must differentiate between a diagnostic test kit and then a screening test kit and balance sensitivity and specificity to allow its use. Mm. If you look at mass populations like market, you don't need a PCR for them. PCR is adequate for a hospital setting where you need high sensitivity and high specificity. For a market, you can balance and trade off sensitivity and specificity. And therefore, this has to be clear. Based on what model did they, did they do this? Based on what methodology? Based on what samples? This, this, this is not... I think that we should be able... We should get a report. But, but, but Dr. Usu, the, 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 key, the key issue for me, which I raised, were uh, 
concerns that have been expressed by the U.S. Center for Disease Control about uh, percentage of false uh, results, false positive, false negatives. These are concerns that the CDC had raised and uh, suggested that uh, antibody testing w wasn't exactly foolproof. So I'm thinking that this is the precaution we need to take when we are considering such methods. Yeah, we have known this for a long time, uh, what, those of us working on coronavirus, is mm. that antibody tests have their own limitations. They have limitations. This is why you use them to augment the PCR tests. They, are, they could not be gold standard. You don't use them in isolation. Mm. It's always an augment, you augment test. You do something in addition to what you have. And this is why you always have to fall on this. Yes, the CDC have issued guidelines. They will say that don't use it for testing hospital patients because of the limitations. But you can use it for screening populations. The White House uses this RDT case to screen those who come in. Although we know the limitation, it has helped a lot to pick up people and for us to go a mm. step ahead to further identify them. So you can't have a foolproof case. You, if 60%, 70%, I mean, it's, even the PCR, based on the quality of your samples, you can lose that sensitivity and specificity. So there is nothing like a 100% test kit. But in emergency situations, you have to deploy some of this kit to augment your testing capacity. We had Mauritius is ahead of Ghana in terms of testing capacity per million. But then if you break down their data, half of their data is from PCR and half is from RDT. Yes, we said that Mauritius is ahead of Ghana. This is what many countries are doing. But we are going, we are we are using the hard approach based on PCR. But we don't this may not help us in the right. long run. Mm, we, we, so I, I want to I want to get more understanding of what was done. And this must be made public for us to know what they are doing mm, so that we right. can help them. To be able to find you this for, to, to benefit uh, right uh, we will get that response from uh, professor Bidu Sarkodia, but professor oh, binka please, please. Uh, uh, professor I, binka I, has to, to say something I'm yeah sorry Prof. To, i'm sorry to interrupt you but yes, this is of very critical importance for what we are going to discuss next where we are removing restrictions and i completely agree with dr wusu that we need to do something about rdt test this specificity and so on is not part of public health discussions no I disagree with the FDA. They should put their data out. We don't agree with that. Look, at the moment, you are using thermometers. You are screening people with thermometers at supermarkets. And if your temperature is above something, they ask you not to go in. What is the specificity and the, uh, what sensitivity of a thermometer gun? But it is better than nothing. It's better than not looking at the person's face and not knowing whether he has the virus or not. Mm. So please, the FDA must do us the favor by approving those tests. They are not the best and they are not the last, but they need they are needed to increase the number of testing and screening so that we can protect people in this country. We don't accept that issue until they publish it. It doesn't make uh, all that well for us. That test that has been developed in Kumasi, it might be 40%. We will use it knowing that it is 40%. The second generation will go to 60%, 80%, and final. But we can't stifle initiative by saying that it's 40%. So, so, what, so what do we do? We throw our hands in the air. No, that's not acceptable. Please, please. Mm, right. Uh, Professor Binka and uh, Dr. Uh, Michael also. I know that this uh, is something that the FDA would need to address. But uh, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, yes, you, you, you heard the gentleman. Progress and I agree. Also, I also uh, submit to the issue that FDA should come out quickly. I'm aware that they are working very closely with laboratory aspects, and then this has there also a discussion with the MOH leadership, so that as soon as possible, how do we move forward with the rapid diagnostic test? This work in progress, and I think sooner there should be a way out. We cannot stay away from this for too long. I also submit to that, and I agree that right. we have to go along using some level of RDT in the country. Mm. So, so Doc, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, I, I like to ask to start a conversation on restrictions, easing of restrictions. I know that South Korea uh, is restrictions, schools were reopened, and they got a second bout of, of coronavirus, and they have to shut down again. So the president's uh, deadlines for restrictions are all supposed to elapse today. What are your expectations uh, moving forward based on the available data we have, the signs, the recoveries, the deaths? What are you expecting the president to tell us when he, he, he addresses the nation? 
Yeah, thank you very much once again. Um, we would provide the data, give some meaning and interpretation to it. And then the high level authorities in their discussion, which I'm aware that there's a very strong, vibrant team that discuss all the signs that are pushed out there to decide the best way forward for the country. Mm. Um, clearly, um, if you look at the data available, the total number of case bedding, uh, initially with the few cases confirmed, it keeps increasing. Then the buildup continues to some extent. And for now, the case bedding per day is on a lower downward trend. Mm. And should we continue this way, it will be a good sign. However, that is con contingent to doing all that we are doing yeah. now, doing it more and even more in intense. So you're talking about agree. sticking with the protocols, yes, washing indeed. of hands, social distancing, these wearing masks, masks and all. So to... these have to be complementary to the achievements that we've had indeed. so far. And then the various measures that we are using now, which you call non-pharmaceutical interventions, there are some of them that require regulation, some of them that needs to be enforced by authorities, but then the most important is how the individual, how they get the information about the virus, how it spreads, signs and symptoms, what to do to avoid the individual, him or herself, con contacting the virus. Indeed, the use of face masks, what is the extent of face masks use? If somebody should start, stand outside here at TV3 and then watch people passing, what is the face mask use? What's the prevalence within the country? You can easily establish that. Mm. Hand washing. If you stand somewhere, people entering this facility, how many of them are conscious of making sure that voluntarily within themselves, they don't need to be forced to wash hands and sanitize themselves. If people are coughing, how has this been a behavior, behavioral part? That's that we are talking about the new norms. They're not in the normal process, a normal period now. People have to internalize certain things to change our behavior as we move and wait for the virus. The best buy for this pandemic fight is the find of virus, sorry, the vaccine, mm. and then the antiviral agent that will directly attack the COVID, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We need a bit of time to do that. And all these non-pharmaceutical interventions are to let us just hold a fort till the time that these things do emerge. I know some time in time you'll reach there. Mm. For how long can we stay out from the areas of enforcement? For how long should the borders be closed? For how long should people, the church, churches, and then the other religious organizations stay away as you wait about it? These are questions that you need to discuss. Mm. But for us, with the data, clearly you are on the downward trend. How long do we sustain this? What can we do so that we don't have a sudden surge mm -hmm. of the case burden and then have a second, um, a second wave of this as we are in now? Mm -hmm. So clearly... So, so, so if you were advising governments, you will present the data, but what would be your recommendation? That restrictions should be eased or should be eased gradually? Restrictions, I mentioned earlier, for how long can Ghana continue to be in such situation as airport closure, schools closed, at all levels? For how long can the churches continue to close down? So clearly, some of these areas, at a point in time, as you wait for vaccine, you have to start moving to close to normal, but then you cannot do it suddenly. Yeah. There should mm. be a well-planned phase approach mm. so, so, so that so, so those, in a church in a church for example how would yes. you ensure that uh, you 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 adhere to social distancing people will be singing clapping praying uh, a church all situation these is, measures will require dialogue interaction meetings with the various authorities mm. and leadership mm. of these agencies and that and will be that will be irrespective of and i'm aware of, this has started mm. indeed um Let's take the church and then the other religious groups. These are well organized, very disciplined, and when we agree with them that this is what we need to do, there will be responsibility and onus on one, the leadership of this country, two, the health sector, three, 
the leadership of such institutions, and then the individual members. What do we need to do to ensure that at all times people plan for such events? There should be some limits and regulations. How many people can you take in a church for now? And when you're talking about social distancing, how can there be church service with people standing one meter apart? People, things that bring out the virus from the respiratory system, not just the COVID and seasons. Singing is loud enough to bring out the viruses out of them. It's, it's equivalent to coughing if people are singing in loud, loud volumes. So these are things that you need to discuss and I agree with them. How can some level of activities go on as we moderate these things so that the gains that we have had will not change? Indeed, the leadership meeting having started, then how do you translate them to these things to um, operational and possibly implementing levels right. and these are things that, these we, are need things that we need to do before we move in and um, the Latin um, proverb for this is fastening lente, you hasten but slowly, you, hasten you don't have to rush slowly. into it. So uh, Dr. Michael, also, I, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll take your, your thoughts on, on, on the easing of restrictions. Uh, I know that uh, the president's announcement of the restrictions and the extension it lasts today. Today is the last day of May. So we are expecting the president to make an announcement on the way forward. Dr. Bedusa Akodia is of the view, hasting slowly. Now, if we look at our case uh, load, the numbers, he's telling us that the daily rates have dropped, have come down tremendously. So in your view, do you get the sense that perhaps we're ready to ease restrictions? Um, I, 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 I don't think we are ready to ease all restrictions. Mm. And then, uh, for, from I mean, what he said, one, one significant thing Dr. Bedusa Kodia said is that he will present the data and the signs of it, which for me is most, most crucial and which should guide us in everything we do. The president sets uh, setting uh, basis for, for discussions and for announcement of this nature. He said that he will be guided by the signs and the data which I think that as public health expert, we need to analyze what the data says, I mean, to him, for, to guide him the decisions. Talking about the numbers and whether they are declining, I don't think our numbers are entirely declining. Our numbers are fluctuating, actually. If you look at the numbers, I, mean, I just pulled the data, somewhere between um, 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 3rd of May, just in the month of May and then 4th of May, the difference in the new case was 550. This is where we had the huge numbers that was as a result of backlogs. Between 11th of May and 12th of May, an average of 430 cases, these were new cases. And then 18th of May and 9th of May, we have 361 new cases. And then recently, 25th and then 26th of May, the difference is about 309. And just recently, you have in 28th May, we have 7,303 cases. And then as of 29th May, we have 7,616 cases. And this is a difference about 330 new cases. But then you need to quantify these cases to give you a reproductive number. And this should be below one to let you know that you are in control of your transmission. Mm. So barely, barely looking at observed values and then saying that, yes, we are declining and maybe all issues must be removed. I think we have to be very careful because WHO has made it clear. The first one is a transmission under control. It's under control by calculating your productive number and ensuring that this is below what to enable you to know that indeed you are in full, I mean, you are ahead of what you're supposed to do. The second point is that WHO said that we have your health system capacity are in place to test, isolate and treat every case and trace every contact. The testing capacity is, is still not adequate. Four to 5,000 tests per day is still not enough for a 31 million population. We still need to do more and ensure that these are available. If churches are operating and there are surges in numbers and people begin to cough, how will you be able to undertake active testing if the testing is limited? I mean, and for me, the same churches and schools that are urging government that it should be open, these are the same churches that are providing centers of isolation for us because we don't have enough facilities. My fear is that if these churches begin to operate and the schools begin to operate, the few hostels by the schools, the few uh, 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 places that the church has given to the county for us to isolation will be taken out 
So where will we isolate the numbers? And the numbers are expected to search. We are 7,000. We may get to 10,000 very soon. Where will you keep them? This will be very, very difficult for us. The way to monitor the third point that you must look at outbreaks in healthcare facilities and nursing homes. We don't have much of nursing homes, but then we have close to about 40 health workers infected. This should tell us that there's a likelihood of nosocomial spread of infection within the healthcare setting. We have not measured that yet. We are not aware of that yet. It is possible that when we ease and there are more cases coming up, our health sector will be too much overburdened, like Prof said earlier. And having and once it's overburdened, the few people with HIV and cancer center will be also be at risk, and the mm. death may search or no win. So mm. my fear is that going just opening up everything may not be the best. But then we must have a phase approach like Dr. Bedusa Kodes. We may have about five phases. The first phase must tell us that indeed, if your data looks like this and maybe your the number is below one, you can start by easing some areas. Maybe per meter square, you can think about having maybe 20 people per meter square to fellowship in a church. But even in Ghana, it's when we talk about churches. Some, some churches are well organized, like the um, traditional ones. But then the major problem is the local churches where are operated by one or two people in remote areas that you may not have the reach of. You can have about 500 people, people praying. And you and I know that in a church, let, let the churches who pray. Somebody will take off the, say the pastor says everybody should take off his mask and begin to shout and, and begin to praise God to, to know people have faith, they have believed that they can do these things. These are people that there are no laws that regulate. You can't we can regulate them. Left to I the know. ones in the cities here to be fine. <laughs> that, but then as also. you move deeper within the areas, you cannot do so. I think that education and then ensuring that people are on board with this, it has not been adequate. And my fear is that if you move to that level, I don't know what will happen. I think that face-wise approach will be very good for us. And having the document clearly laid out and people educated in this will also be very good for us. So right. uh, these are my few points. Well, right, Dr. Dr. Michael, also, I'll come to you, Professor Binka, but uh, this is key points. Uh, we'll take a break and we'll return. We'll get the views from uh, Professor uh, Binka and then uh, we'll still have in the studio uh, Dr. Bidu Sakode. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. And remember, we're streaming live on Facebook and on 3news.com. Welcome back to Key Points. We have about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. This is the second part of Key Points, and we're discussing Ghana's COVID-19 case. I have Dr. Bedu Sakode in the studio, and Professor Binka, and uh, Dr. Ose, uh, Dr. Owusu, also on Zoom. Uh, Professor Binka wanted to make a, a quick comment uh, before we get the reactions from Dr. Bedu Sakode. So, Professor Binka, you, 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 we heard Dr. Wusu a while ago about the need for phased easing of restrictions, which is the same view uh, Dr. Bedu Sakode holds. But Dr. Sakode is firm on the belief that we need to make this decision based on the data and science. Your views also. So, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying that I really endorse all the statements that Dr. Michael Owusu has put across. And uh, maybe I'll re-emphasize a few, but I think we should start by doing this slowly and with the uh, express remembering that we want to save lives. That is the most important thing. So first of all, I know that there will be this, the pressure on the president is so high, the restrictions some of them will fall off, but let's go about it slowly. But we also, on the public health side, have some demands that must be met because you just don't remove the restrictions and then when there's a problem, then we are called upon to try and uh, uh, well, solve the problem. So my first thing is that masks, now I call them face, uh, uh, face coverings so, so, so that they don't go towards the regulations. The masks must be provided free to everybody. And government can work with religious bodies, name it, whoever is interested, to make sure that people have masks. It is only when we have made sure that people have masks that we can enforce it. So in a public health tool like this, that is a public good, government must make sure that it provides masks to its people. And then we can enforce it. Without the mask, distance, social distancing and those things are going to be a challenge at church, at the mosque, it's a challenge at the markets, it's a challenge in, at the lorry stations and so on. So let's invest some little bit of money and provide masks to many people outside the uh, what big towns 
and make sure that in the rural areas, these are done. That's my first point. Second is that we need to provide adequate testing. And if I were putting a condition for removing the restrictions, one of it is that we should license the RGT test. Because now we are going to open up people and we must have a tool that is better than looking at your face. That's what I'm talking about. Looking at your face cannot tell me whether you have the disease or not. But the RDC testing should be licensed. Tell us how sensitive it is. 30, 40 percent. But this, I'm not licensing stuff. I think that's not uh, bode well for the, 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 the whole country. We are going to remove restrictions because it's not a perfect situation. People have to end their livelihoods and so on. So we should use the tools that we have with us, and especially this is made in Ghana. We can produce it here. We have to use it to help us to screen people and to make sure that we are ahead of the virus. We are able to track where things are going. And I, I don't just understand how we, we could just leave such things uh, to a few people to make a decision. Right. That's not that's not good enough. Right. Uh, Thirdly, hmm. wait, 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 wait. I'm not finished yet. Thirdly, I think related to this is the fact that. Uh, Dr. Usu said it, but you have to also, I think the press must listen to this very carefully. The quarantine and isolation facilities must be inspected. We have to see where are the quarantine and isolation facilities. This terminology that we use in Ghana, self-isolation, is not in any book. Our people don't know isolation, and I don't know what the concept of self-isolation actually means. The bulk of Ghanaians cannot self-isolate. So we have to isolate them after we tested them and make sure that they are well right. and that they don't transmit to other people. Right. Finally, mm. finally, finally, I think we need to enhance the surveillance teams. As we open up, we have to get more people involved in the surveillance so that we can find the disease. Right. Otherwise, we are going to have big explosions and we will all be running around trying to rescue those explosions. Right. Uh, That's not how pandemics are controlled. Professor Thank Binka, you. we're grateful for your time. And Dr. Michael, also grateful for your time also. It's been a wonderful having you on the show this morning. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that, that's, that's uh, how we wrap up with the conversation on Zoom. So, uh, Dr. Bedisakode, you have the final word before we, we, we leave our studios this morning. So the discussion on easing of restrictions, uh, you have raised uh, critical thoughts about how it's necessary for us to do this in phases. And this should be supported by the existing science and data. Uh, tell me what your final conclusions will be on this decision if government uh, chooses to make it. Yeah, thank you once again. Indeed, um, this panel of four, you, myself, and then the other two colleagues mm. through Zoom, I don't think we, have, we disagree to um, easing. Mm. But how to do it is the issue. Indeed, uh, clearly, when you are talking about data, the data within the country suggests now that reducing daily case incidents, the low death rate, few critical conditions, health systems are not stressed. Indeed, for now, unlike other areas where there is surge and that they cannot handle it, the surveillance team, the case management team, the public education team, you are not stressed. And these are clear signs that we have done well using the earlier time lag that we have to prepare well. We have increased capacity in the treaties, which is the, um, the policy for us as a country and as the model that we are running and that we are tracing, testing, treating, we isolate these people and we have contingency for this and it's running well. There's increased capacity and FEDA have strengthened this. The various health economic implications, these have been assessed adequately. There is health, the various sector profile which are being assessed. If you are talking about the religious sector, the Muslims, the Christians, how are we assessing the profile to indicate that the level of easing we have to um, approach? Clearly, if we, there are various activities like the simple services, the various conventions, those things can wait. 
by immediately some services involving up to some limited number of people. I don't think that um, we cannot handle this. But then, as you do this, you should monitor very closely, driving as you watch the dashboard very closely. If there are any emergence on the dashboard indicating that you have to caution, open your engine and reassess the situation, you have to do that. So these things have been are being assessed, there is adequate interaction, discussion with the various leadership of such institutions. The churches, the Muslim group, the various institutions, the Ghana Education Service, clearly they have a very elaborate roadmap mm -hmm. indicating who should go first, the priority for those um, time-bound school activities. Students that are going to write exams, prepare them give them some time, the others will be at home. They have enough space within the schools to add and they take such activities, finish their exams, they will come home, and then we will think about others how to go forward. And indeed, the various um, activities that, and things that need to be put in place for, to ensure hand hygiene, to ensure respiratory hygiene, to ensure everybody, every student has masks all the time. Right. The support teams, all these things have to be undertaking. And then the ability for us to respond to surge, indeed, is very important. And I think Professor Abinka mentioned it. I agree with him. This has to be in phase and progressive approach. So let's identify the priority set that has to be done, priority activity for now. And then we need to think about it. Build capacity, plan, you review, you learn. It's important that you develop safety protocols. For all these things, the best is for the various institutions, giving them initial sensitization, let them develop their protocol. Mm. The expert team will sit and review of them. Right. We agree and see how we will move forward as a team. How do we make sure that these things that we have planned with the various institutions, we do enforce them? Enforcement is very key. Self enforcement, leadership enforcement, and then obviously the regulatory and various enforcing mechanisms in the country is important. So these are things that right. we have to put. I, uh, I should conclude, really finally, mm. we should have in mind that these institutions, some of them have the potential to support the fight in themselves. They have inherent potential. When you talk about churches, they are disciplined, you have the numbers, they respect their leadership. If a pastor stands on the podium and say that everybody should move, wear masks, from here, and when you go home, that and is what that sort will thing. happen. So, if the religion, your view is that the churches play have a lot good of potential, also potential in the schools, to be used for and education. these are very disciplined institutions that we think that we should not look sight on them. Right. But then, Dr. finally, Dr. finally, mm. our time is up. We actually. are looking at mm. human beings, and then the human life, health is one. Other socio-economic activities impact on life. Yeah, in planting season, if you joke and play with this very moment. The next year by now, Ghana will be in farming, right. so uh, you have to think through life as a whole. Health is very important, but it's just one component of it. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much, extremely. Dr. Bedis Akode, and thanks to Professor Binka and Dr. Michael Osu. Thanks to you for making time to be with us here on Key Points. I'm Stephen Enti.